Good morning. So we'll get started. Uh, so uh, who am I? So my name is Rodney McAfee. I am a professional engineer, geotechnical. Don't hold that against me. Foundation <laughs> stuff. Um, worked for uh, uh, approximately 20 years for a small company called Stantec. You may have heard of them. And uh, about seven years for an applied R&D facility in Newfoundland called Secor. Uh, so now I'm with this company called CognisSpark. And what do we do? Uh, we have created a remote worker support solution using the Microsoft HoloLens and mixed reality to allow workers to connect more meaningfully back to an expert anywhere in the world. That's the whole intent of our solution. But I'm here to talk about uh, augmented reality in general and how it fits into construction and not, not only talk about uh, remote worker support solution, but the other applications for augmented or mixed reality and what is the difference between augmented, mixed, and, and stuff of that nature. We're based here in Fredericton. Uh, we're, we've been in existence for just over three years, I guess. Uh, we have uh, approximately 20 staff now, and we have clients, uh, well, all over the world. Uh, so we're doing big things for a company based here in Fredericton. So we're very proud of that. So uh, there's a small group, so feel free to interrupt, ask questions, stop me at any point, because sometimes I get going fast. Uh, but uh, so the gist of what I'm going to cover here is uh, this little outline here. So like I said, talk about what is augmented reality uh, versus... Uh, virtual reality, mixed reality, kind of where all that fits. How it fits in the industry, not just construction, but like we do a lot of stuff with manufacturing, oil and gas, uh, aerospace defense, stuff like that. So I talk about the whole thing. And then in general, uh, I want to talk a little bit about industrial wearables and knowledge transfer. I, I think that's one of the key things, one of my messages here today will be knowledge transfer. Uh, and I'll explain more about that when we get into it. And then I have probably, I think I got maybe five, six general use cases. Uh, people tend to like to hear what other people are doing uh, with this type of technology and seeing uh, how they're uh, you know, saving money, saving time, benefiting from, from using it. And it helps a lot of people understand how it might fit into their business. And I'm going to talk about remote worker support because I mean, that is what we do. So that's going to be part of what I talk about, not just the general use cases, but specifically that. And then I'm going to kind of shift gears about kind of what it takes to have a successful pilot project. Uh, like I said, we've been in this for a little over three years now. And admittedly, at the start, uh, when we would do a deployment with a client, sometimes it went great, sometimes it was a little rocky. And part of that was there was a learning curve. A learning curve for us, a learning curve for everybody else. This is brand new technology. What is the best, the most effective way to deploy it to get success quick and not have a pilot project kind of falters and stumbles and, and stuff like that? Uh, so we've learned some strategies around that, so I'm going to share that. And then just kind of big picture in general, the AR maturity, kind of where, where industry is as a whole, but more, more importantly, kind of where you can chart your path through that AR maturity in terms of the adoption. You know, like are you just starting, or are you more mature into it, or are you leading in the space is basically what that's about. All right, so first thing is just kind of to uh, uh, set the stage in terms of Virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. You may have heard the term extended reality. That's kind of the new catch-all to encompass everything, the extended reality term, XR. Uh, but I'll start with virtual reality. So I think most people understand that clearly. It's a headset that closes you off from your surroundings. You don't see anything of the real world, and you're completely in an imaginary, created digital world, what you're seeing. And that has great applications for uh, design, and uh, you, know, you want to show a client a new facility that doesn't exist, but you've created it you know, in, in CAD world and you want to show it to them, it's a really good way for them to walk through and experience it. But on the other end of the spectrum, if, if contextually it's important to see your surroundings, virtual reality does not do that. You just, you're cut off from it, so it doesn't work that way. Now augmented reality is, I mean, everybody remembers, I don't know how many years ago it was now, five, six, seven years ago, Pokemon Go came out. And everybody was running around the streets, and they had their phones, and that's augmented reality, you know, like, you hold, have a device, you hold it up over something, and there's something there. You know, maybe there's a, a person in that chair that's not really there, but when I look through my phone or a tablet, you see it. That's augmented. And the difference between the augmented reality and mixed reality, it's subtle, but it's important. Mixed reality allows you to interact with that object. You can manipulate it, you can send commands to it, it can change, it can be animated, it can do things like that. Whereas with augmented reality, you don't. You just simply see kind of augmented information. And like I said, extended reality is, is everything. That's you know, your virtual, your augmented, mixed, all that. It's just all in. 
So this technology as a whole, the VR, AR space, MR, I'll use, I'll use AR and MR, the augmented mixed reality interchangeably because they kind of are, but I've highlighted what the, the real difference is on the mixed reality. Uh, but this is growing by a crazy amount. Uh, you know, if you kind of look at the plot like back in 2015 up to 2020, but more importantly, if you look at uh, the prediction through IDC here, spending on AR, VR by industry is expected to be 160 billion in 2013. That's not very far away. Uh, you know, this is becoming pervasive in industry and like factories and on job sites uh, and in various ways. Robbie, can I, can I pause you a bit? Now? Yep. Um, like 25 years ago, I had Prince Charles in my lap, Miramichi with a head mount display on. Yeah. And every, you know, every five years or 10 years, you see you know, all these billion dollars, you know, and do you think it's actually true now? Like we're actually going to get to the point where it's a common, you know, because uh, always here, say 25 years ago, yeah. when I had Sense8, Superscape, and, you know, it was going to be it, you know, like things have changed now with Wi-Fi. And, but do you think um, that those numbers are real now? Like, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. back then, they never happened, you know, it, 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 because to pay nine hundred dollars for an HM and MV and the Hololens two now is out. What is it? Three grand or four grand? Thirty five hundred US. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like you think it's going to be commonplace? That's yeah. The thing. Yeah, I do. Um, just kind of set that stage. So yeah. virtual reality. Yeah. Uh, if you went back ten years ago, some people had it, right? It wasn't. But now, like if I go somewhere, like if I you know walk into Woods office or mm -hmm. or Worley, they have a room dedicated for VR. Like it's, it's, it's a priority now, it's kind of a given, like it's not a, like uh, uh, virtual reality is past the, you know, the early adopter stage and it's now very common. Uh, admittedly, augmented reality, mixed reality solutions are still kind of growing and that's why you see that big crazy trend, like the upward trend, because some companies are doing, and I'll talk about some of the use cases where it is, but some are still kind of thinking about it and some are all in big, like the US military signed a contract for, you know, has nearly $500 million with Microsoft to buy HoloLens units. That's a big purchase. I mean, they want 100,000 units, wow. right? I mean, that's, uh, that, that sends a message, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that it's here and it's ready and it's now sort of thing. Yeah. But it's a really good question because yeah, yeah there's a lot of talk and hype oh, around it, right? Everybody. And where is it? You know what yeah, I mean? Look at Google Glass. Yeah, well that came and went, right? <laughs> like it crashed and burned. Yeah. And, and you'll see that, like I was at an event down in Dallas recently that it was it's called Enterprise Wearables right. Technology Summit. So it's it's all the different hardware manufacturers showcasing what they've got. And there's all a bunch of different head mounted displays now. Like the Holland's only one, right? I mean, you've got your third eye, you've got your Magic Leap, you've got, you know, the ones that have the Monarch device and all that kind of stuff. And different industries and different use cases are a better fit for different pieces of hardware, right? right? Yeah. So one isn't going to be the only one. And of the maybe, you know, 10 devices out now, they probably all won't be in existence in five years, but there'll be new ones in to replace some of the ones that disappear, right? So, so the sectors that we're working in, uh, our company, uh, are aerospace defense, industrial engineering, utilities, oil and gas, uh, construction, nuclear engineering, manufacturing, mining, food pressing. Uh, where I would rank them in terms of uh, kind of who's ahead of whom, uh, I'd say probably a uh, mix between aerospace defense and oil and gas would be kind of leading, would be my kind of sense on that. Uh, oil and gas, you've got big players like Equinor, Norway, formerly Stat Oil. They're adopting in mass. Uh, people like ExxonMobil are big into it as well. Uh, aerospace, uh, that's not my area, especially as my colleague, but I mean, he could talk about all the companies that are doing different things. It has to do with, you know, uh, when, when you think defense, you automatically think kind of military combat situations. And for the most part, that is not the applications, at least that I'm aware of, where it's being used. It's more in the manufacturing or uh, maintenance. So even like our largest client is Canadian military, and uh, they're using it for repair situations primarily and maintenance. So it's not you know combat type applications. I'm not saying it won't be in the future, but right now it isn't. And utilities, uh, you know, like for either power generation or power distribution, that's kind of in that in that realm of things. Uh, I think construction is lagging. I'll talk more about that. Uh, when we get into it. But I mean, we have a couple of clients now in the construction industry and I'd like to see a lot more. But I mean, we got way more activity in oil and gas. We even have more activity in the nuclear sector than we do in construction. Uh, you know, and manufacturing, I'd say, might be the hottest of all the sectors uh, in terms of growth potential. Uh, there seems to be a lot of interest uh, in it there and a lot of early adopters.
going in kind of big. Mining would be lagging in my opinion as well, kind of in the same category as construction. And food processing, people like McCain Foods and stuff like that, uh, that have you know, a lot of plants and stuff. Uh, we have a deployment with them right now. So just kind of give you a feel of, of where we work, who our clients are. So I have some, uh, you know, I kind of went on to a few of the uh, um, uh, sites that, that focus on construction, and I found some interesting quotes around kind of technology, you know, like new technology is propelling the industry into a more productive and efficient future. So a recent um, a JDI roundtable here in New Brunswick, I mean, that was the whole emphasis. It was must increase productivity. How do you do that? You don't work harder. You be a little more smarter about how you do it. Use more innovative solutions, more intelligent. And then about just you know the whole digital transformation. So design, construction, and facility management industry are embracing digital transformation, and benefiting from adopting new technologies. And that is the key. I mean, those who adopt the new technologies and successfully implement it will see increases in productivity. And as a result, we'll move into it even further, like embracing IoT, the Internet of Things, stuff of that nature. Quoting a couple reports, uh, the first one by uh, uh, McKinsey Global, uh, and that is about increasing productivity. I mean, that is what needs to happen. Companies need to increase productivity to be able to stay competitive and how to, you know, they want to lead, they got to be the most, the most uh, efficient of their peers. 70% uh, of construction companies believe those who do not adopt digital ways of working will go out of business. That's quite a, a bold statement, but I, I think there's truth in it for sure. 62% uh, of construction companies believe the sector is behind others when it comes to adopting digital technologies. Now, that's kind of my sense, too, from talking with uh, people in the construction industry. But there's time to catch up. Uh, this is uh, some quotes I took from uh, a company we're working with, Multiplex. Uh, so uh, 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 the president of Multiplex gave a presentation recently, and these are some quotes from it. Those who don't develop a digital strategy may be left behind. Uh, the contractors will achieve the same production with half the amount of people. So those who are adopting will become that much more efficient and, and, and productivity go up that they'll be far more competitive against those who don't because they're doing basically twice the work with you know the same amount of, of, of input. Started seeing productivity challenge about five years ago so ex as the experience uh, workers began to retire. So I mentioned knowledge transfer at the start and how important that was. And that, this is part of that. Uh, we have a shift in demographics. Baby boomers are getting out of the workforce. Uh, you know, the, the group coming up just doesn't have the same experience or skill set necessarily. And it's going to be so important to transfer the knowledge from those that are close to leaving or about to leave to the younger generation so that we don't have that gap. And that gap's been identified now as an issue. Uh, it's one of the things when I talk to uh, most clients uh, during the initial engagements, that's that's a big priority for them that, that they all emphasize. IoT. Um, how many are familiar with IoT, the Internet of Things? So, I mean, you know, I have equipment, you have sensors on it, uh, you collect the data. What the heck do you do with the data? Well, that's the important thing. If you're doing something constructive with it, it becomes important. Whether it's predictive analytics for, you know, this pump is going to need to be serviced in approximately a month based on the data I see. Or it's uh, the, also the case where a worker is in an area and as you walk through it, you see all the sensor data hovering over the equipment. Because a lot of the clients will have uh, sensors on an industrial site, like in a room full of compressors, pumps, whatever, but there's no displays in that room. There's no consoles, there's no readout units. So what do they do? They call somebody, some God knows where they're located, different city probably, wherever, Somebody who sees that data and they say, you know, I'm, I'm here in building, you know, B2, looking at compressor 17. I was sent out to do some work on it, but I don't know what it's doing. Tell me what it's doing right now. Well, instead, if you could see that in real time by standing there, that's a benefit, right? So it's not just, not just having the IoT and what are you going to do with it, but how readily available is the data? How can you, how can you access it? So it's important to harness that. Uh, Off-site prefabrication, I know that's a, a, a focus here for the UMB research group. Um, and, and it's something that, that is it, like the adoption technology, this will be part of that, uh, the augmented reality, mixed reality. Uh, you know, they've been doing it for a while, but if you don't, if you weren't involved in it a while ago, you don't realize how difficult it was uh, dealing with alignments, accuracies, tolerances, stuff like that. And with digital scanning, 
They're getting a lot better at it now. There's no question about that. So the technology is advancing and helping that whole thing. So in a similar way, augmented reality, mixed reality technologies are advancing, becoming much more commonplace, much more mature, and, and able to actually be a benefit in the workplace. Industrial wearables. So I mentioned, you know, this event in Dallas that I was at, where everybody's showcasing all this different kit, and uh, you know, why is it important? Why why are all these people looking at it? And it has to do with, you know, industrial workers are being asked to do more and more. And I'm using industrial workers, construction workers. I mean, it's, from my perspective, it's interchangeable, right? You're at your place of work, your job site, whatever that may be, and you know, you have a lot of responsibilities. And what are one of the things you've got to do? You got to you got to stay alert. Right, and then we use the term heads up, hands free. So if you're using a wearable device, your heads up, hands free, as opposed to walking around with a tablet. If you're walking around with a tablet, you're looking down, right? That could be dangerous. So from a health and safety point of view, there are great benefits to wearable technology as well. And it's also, um, so I mentioned the safety here. So I have a, a reference here at the bottom, Boeing study. So uh, Boeing, so you know, they make airplanes. Uh, you know, they're embracing this big time. Uh, they did a bunch of studies internally, and one of the study findings was, you know, they sent three groups of workers in to do a task they've never done before. These are all skilled workers, you know, they, they know what they're doing, but they've never done this task before. They sent in one third of the group with paper products, old school manuals like specs and drawings, you know, all rolled up under your arm stuff, walk in, and another group went in with all the same information, but on tablets, so it's just digital, PDFs and whatnot. Another group went in with mixed reality devices, and for that study they were using the HoloLens as well. And so for them, all the information was, it was just there, they could call it up, and it was, it was three-dimensional, it was you know, a full digital hologram they could walk around, interact with. And what they found was that of those three groups of workers, the group with the mixed reality solution were nearly twice as likely to complete the task correct on first attempt. So that was important. The other people faltered. They weren't as accurate, they weren't as good on that first attempt with that traditional information, whereas the other set were quicker to grasp it and hence get it correct on that first attempt. But just as important, the group with the mixed reality solution completed the task in approximately one third of the time. That's huge. That's really big. And why is that? If you think about it, as engineers, we spend a lot of time learning how to not only make drawings, but to interpret drawings. You know, when you give somebody a drawing package, maybe there's 50 drawings. That's 50 different views, sections, details, all the information. I prepared drawing packages that were bigger than 50 drawings. I mean, there's a lot of information in there. So if you give somebody that drawing package and say, okay, you gotta figure this out, and then, you know, build that or whatever. If you give them the information in a three-dimensional hologram that they can interact with, walk around, walk through, see, go into, see the inside of it, whatever, it's a whole different thing. There's no interpretation required. You just simply look at it and I understand it. It's three-dimensional. You don't have to make that transition from 2D to 3D. The other finding of the Boeing study was that, so not only nearly twice as likely to complete it correct on first attempt, in a third of the time, but they have significantly fewer errors. So it was a win-win. And I'm assuming everything's recorded, so you have the documented uh, quality control at the same time. You certainly can. I mean, there are solutions to record that stuff. So if you want that, that's something you can do. Right. <coughs> so the whole point of augmented reality is not to replace workers. It's to uh, augment them or empower them, right? And if a worker can respond to changing conditions quickly, then you're going to reduce downtime, you're going to reduce delays, and that tends to be the bigger cost savings. Uh, you know, when we talk to most people in the industry, you say, you know, what's, what's lost production for you cost? Like, you know, if you're, if you make, whatever it is you make, whether it's you're assembling buildings, or you're, you know, on a, uh, doing earthworks on a project, or it's uh, manufacturing, or oil and gas, everybody has a dollar figure they can tell you associated with downtime or delays. And that tends to be very large numbers. If you're talking oil and gas, it tends to be you know six figure. If you're talking nuclear, it tends to be seven figure. Uh, construction, it depends on the site. It could be anywhere from tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, really easy per day. Uh, you know they have numbers, and that's what it's all about. It's about anticipating problems before they occur. It's about reacting quickly to problems, connecting the right people to the situation, and being able to move along. 
And then with, um, uh, you know, being able to access schematics, data sheets, call an expert for support, you know, these are the things that make a difference. So I've got Porsche technician example. I really like this story, it's kind of cool. Because, you know, everybody likes a Porsche car, so kind of cool, right? Uh, not that I don't, I don't know one or anything, but uh, anyway, they're really neat. So Porsche are known for high performance sports cars. They are also known, if you ever look at the JD Power uh, customer satisfaction surveys, to be near the top, right? They have a product that everybody likes. They have a product that tends to be reliable, very few errors when it's first delivered to the, to the customers. This is all good. But Porsche had a problem. Uh, when cars would come in for service, uh, quite often some would have issues that the, the technician mechanic could not resolve. So they would have to reach out to somebody else in the organization, probably in Germany or wherever, to resolve this issue. And they had established the baseline metrics for this problem, because it was an issue and they were identifying it. On average, it was taking 17 days to resolve issues that came up that they couldn't resolve on their own, right? So you buy this really expensive sports car for at least $100,000, and you take it in because it's got a rattling noise or something, and on average, 17 days. That means in some cases, maybe it was four or five days, but in other cases, maybe it was like more like 30 or 40 days. But I mean, that's just simply too long. So they identified that the major issue was that they couldn't communicate effectively with the, uh, the technician or mechanic at the dealership, say, in I think our closest one is what, Halifax? Uh, Halifax to wherever that is, whether that's Germany or somewhere else in North America or whatever. They adopted wearable technologies and used it for remote worker support, connecting their technicians at the local dealerships with the expert. Now, their results are impressive. So they went from an average of 17 days to 15 minutes. Because the mechanics read into it, he's not sure, you connect to somebody, whoever this magic person is that seems to know everything, whether it's back in you know, Stuttgart, Germany, or, or at some sort of central uh, uh, North American location because you have the ability to connect to whoever you need to. And that person, if they can answer that question right then, you don't lose any time. So 17 days, 15 minutes. That just tells you kind of the power of that. And it's a very simple thing. All they did was connect somebody in a way that that remote person could see what the mechanic could see. That's all they did. I probably probably use nine different conference systems for video, Skype, team meeting, you know, you know. Yeah. What's have you seen any stat to support how more powerful and you know, a method or mixed is better than video conferencing? Like, you know, on the training and you know what I mean? Like, oh yeah. Well and when you're talking about remote worker support, I mean <laughs> you have to consider how do you do it with say a smartphone, right? You hold it. You're doing a FaceTime, it's looking at you, you turn it around, you're looking at it, then you end up taking maybe pictures and emailing them. It, and it's been shown time and time, it's not an efficient way or effective way to do it. Whereas if you're just simply wearing a headset and they see what you see and they're talking to you, so as you're working on something, they can say, no, no, not that, just, you know, it, it's, your hands are free. The biggest problem with the other devices is they're not. So you, okay, you prop it up somewhere, but then it's not looking at the right direction. You know what I mean? And we have clients that'll tell us that, you know, customer will call, a good one was in the uh, forestry sector. So they make uh, specialized equipment, in this case it was an edger, uh, for edging boards. And, uh, uh, you know, customer call, they're using this, this edging device that, that, you know, the company had created and manufactured, installed, commissioned, all that, so they know it inside out. And the people in the field are describing a problem. And, you know, they thought they understood what they were talking about, because they were using slightly different terminology and lingo. Uh, so anyway, after a couple hours on the phone, they were unable to resolve the issue. So they sent somebody to site. They get to site, and the site person comes over and says, yeah, yeah, here's my problem. That's not what we thought you were talking about. It was a completely different thing. If only they could have saw what they saw. As simple as that, right? All right, so now I'm going to talk about kind of the general use cases of augmented reality. Uh, so not just restricted to kind of our area, which is remote collaboration assistance, but all of it, like data visualization, spatial mapping, simulation training, 3D modeling, just to kind of give you a sense of what the big picture is. And we create one piece of software that does remote collaboration assistance, but there's other companies that do the other stuff. 
So this isn't a case where you invest in the hardware and you only get one app. This is a laptop. You can put as many apps on as you want. It's no different than that, right? It has actually similar computational power and whatnot. The only real difference is instead of having a monitor like my laptop, this displays all the stuff in a 3D immersive way. It's the only difference. So you can buy like 27 different apps to do 27 different things. It's like Word won't do, well, it can, but not well, what Excel does, right? You don't do spreadsheets in Word. You can, but people shouldn't do that because it's really limited what it can do. But you should have the right app for the job. And this is no different. So there's different categories of solutions for augmented reality, and there's different apps. Different people are doing different solutions for it. So the first one I'm going to talk about is spatial mapping and planning. So one of the things about the HoloLens specifically, and, and I'll, I guess I'll just take the moment to mention that. So our solution, the reason I have the HoloLens here is our solution uses this. This is the Microsoft HoloLens. There are other hardware on the market. We are not tied to only use this. We will make our software work on other products. But right now, it only works on this because this is the only one that can do what we need it to do. That's what it boils down to. The other pieces of hardware aren't there yet. When they are, we will have our software working on them, and that will come with time. But the nice thing about this device is when you put it on, turn it on, it maps the room. It knows where the walls are, the ceiling is, the floor is, desks, people, it picks that all out. So when you place a hologram, it anchors it, stays where you put it, basically. If you leave the room and come back, the hologram's still there. You could turn around and look, and it's still there. You walk around it, it stays there. So the nice thing about this is you can actually place digital objects in a space and see how they look. So one of our clients does ship design, uh, and, and their use case for this kind of application is when they're redoing the bridge of a ship, and they've got everything taken out of it, and they want to see what all the new stuff looks like. They've got it all designed, they've got all the CAD files, but then what? How do you, you know, you don't mock stuff up, that's not as easy but you can just bring them in as holograms and place them and kind of look at workflow and stuff like that. And you know, I even check to see how, you know, getting stuff around turns, all that kind of stuff. Really easy way to do it. So the use case I'm gonna talk about here is Thyssen Group. So everybody knows them for elevators, but they also do uh, chairlifts. Chairlifts is a big business for them. And uh, they're, a huge, they're probably the biggest adopter in the world for mixed reality right now. I think they have 850 HoloLens device, devices uh, deployed within the organization. And they're seeing huge benefits, and this is one good example of that. So when they design a stair or a chairlift to go up the stairs for a residential application, historically it was a process. It took four trips to site and tended to take a little over eight weeks to complete the whole installation. Because they had to go and they had to measure. And then they had to take that information back to the design team and come up with what it looked like. And then they had to go back and check all that before you don't want to start fabrication, you know, kind of measure twice, cut once, that rule. That. So you want to make sure you've got that all sorted out. Uh, so they went back the second time. And then they actually had kind of a session with the homeowners to show them what everything looked like. And then there's one more step. There's one more step before they showed up to install, but they had four trips to site. So what they did is they said, you know, how can mixed reality help us with that? So when they started out, they started out kind of um, uh, not, they were uh, the opposite of ambitious. They were very conservative in terms of, it's like, okay, we'll just use it to do this. We'll use it to do the measurements. So they started with that. So they came in and they, they created a special <laughs> device that the, the, hall, the hall lens would watch all the measurements be taken with a special device, and then the information was automatically uploaded to their system for the design team to use, right there and then. And they said, that's great. So they did that a few times, then they realized, you know, we're missing a few opportunities here, so they started ramping things up. And what they added was the ability to not only collect that data using the hall lens, which was really much faster than their old way and more accurate, but they said, well, hey, we've uploaded this like, like instantaneously to the design team. And you know, the design team really only needs like you know, 15, 20 minutes to throw together the first design. Like, because it just goes into the system, it crunches out, they check a few things, they you know, make a few adjustments, and it's, there, there is a draft version of it sort of thing. And they said, well, hey, the guy's still at the site, so you know, why not uh, just 
feed that information back to the HoloLens and display what it looks like to do the, you know, the fine checks and all that. So all of a sudden that's eliminating one of the trips. And oh, the, the homeowners, we can arrange, they're there at the same time so they can look at it, see how it looks. So all of a sudden, three of the trips were all rolled into one and they were all happening while the person's on site for less than an hour. So it was shaving a lot of time and effort off the whole thing. And in the end, they reduced the whole process from over eight weeks down to two, from first engagement to final installation. And the message they gave, and this was the, uh, the president of um, uh, Thiessen Group for North American Operations. Like he said, okay, like it saved us money. But he said, think about the customer satisfaction. How do you quantify that from their perspective, right? He said, you know, somebody has had something happen in their life that they can no longer go up and down the stairs. So they realize they need a chairlift. Well, are, you know, is it going to be good to wait eight, nine, ten weeks before you get it? Like that's not good customer satisfaction. So to be able to deliver that much faster is worth a lot to them, but it's not necessarily, uh, you know, something you can easily quantify in terms of dollar figures for savings. But they did have savings in the whole process because they eliminated all the trips and all that, right? So, but I, I, that's a, a real good use case for the spatial mapping. So the second category I'm going to talk about is the 3D modeling and product design. So, you know, how are you going to use that? So if you can take a 3D CAD file and look at it as a full size, two scale model, whatever that may be. In this case, you see there's a jet engine, but I mean, it could be a, a, a it could be a building, it could be whatever. Maybe you don't want to do full size for a big building, but you could do reduced scale or whatever. Uh, it makes a difference in terms of how you, you know, like I was saying earlier about looking at drawings or even something on a screen that you're rotating, checking out. You can actually walk around it, you can walk through it. Because uh, one of the nice things about holograms is if you have a true three dimensional hologram, like CAD file, it's a true three dimensional hologram. By that I mean you can walk into it. So if there's stuff on the inside that is there, the hall lens is smart enough to know to show it to you when you're on the inside of the hologram as opposed to the outside. What's the size of the model that you, could you have a whole building? You can, uh, and you can make it, if you're out in a parking lot, you can make it full size and it looks full size and it's like that. But you can't, uh, you know, obviously if you're in this room, you can only go as big as the room and then stuff starts going outside the room, you know what I mean? Right. And what's the accuracy of it? So it's GPS that tracks where you're standing? Inside no, the... no. Uh, it does spatial anchoring based on mapping of your space. Okay. So that's one of the other issues. If you make your hologram too big, like say it is a building, you're out in the parking lot, you're going to make it full size. You can see it. Right. But it, it, if you're walking around the parking lot thinking you're walking through the first floor of the building, then it's probably going to move a little bit with you because it's having trouble with spatial anchoring because it doesn't have walls and floors and desks and... The whole lens has limitations how far it sees and how far it maps, right? When you were in Dallas, uh, you know, looking at all the sense, <coughs> um, did, did you see any haptic devices that were that could integrate with 3D modeling, where you get to feel the surface or feel the interaction? Yeah. So as part of the uh, this enterprise wearables technology summit, and I hadn't even thought about it uh, when I went down because I'm only thinking, you know, the the head mounted displays. Mm -hmm. But they had a whole thing down there on the haptic feedback, like for gloves. Yeah. And they even had the exoskeleton stuff, which is different. But yeah. that the exoskeleton and the haptic feedback glove type things were like, what the heck is that? Like from my perspective, right? So I was over checking it out. I was like, oh, where, where do you use that? The exoskeletons I can see. Yeah. You know, you're in a warehouse, you're lifting big things. And basically, they could be it's like Iron Man or something, right? You <laughs> get this big outfit on, you pick up big, heavy things and move it around. But the haptic feedback gloves, I wasn't sure. I think it's. I think it was strictly from a training perspective. I right. think is what they were pitching at the start. Uh, but to my knowledge, that hasn't been coupled directly, at least to any uh, uh, AR, MR applications I've seen. It certainly could be, and probably will be at some point. I did one for IED digging, the haptic joystick, basically. Okay. You feel digging the sand. And you like the resistance yeah, and okay. Yeah, so that was like seven years ago. So yeah, because that's a pretty sensitive area. And, uh, but I'm just wondering on the manufacturing, if you've seen any uh, highlights or any um, any any designs that were more were more haptic related with lens, micro lens or uh, hollow lens, you know, that were more adaptable, like like the gloves or yeah. Well, and know, the gloves like, exist. Yes. Yeah. 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 And they look like a normal pair of gloves, but they give feedback to you as you do things. Well, like imagine so. one big example. You can actually feel the whole surface of the device, but it doesn't exist. Right. 
Right. Like right. So if you go to touch a, uh, a hologram, you know, then you, you would get the sense of feel. Yeah. Yeah. So you can feel the surface. You can yeah. even feel the texture. But this speaks yeah. to where the technology is evolving, where yeah. it's getting to, right? Like it's 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 a big difference what Kalina was five years ago. <coughs> so the example I'm going to touch upon here is uh, Ford, and uh, Packers doing something similar with trucks. Uh, so instead of having to do clay models as much anyway, I think they still do clay models, but they can eliminate a lot of the situations where you simply, in this case, there is a real car there, but you're going to augment or show what it looks like different. And, and the example, a specific example I'll give is uh, in the video clip, they show how they can simply alter the shape or look of, say, the side mirrors. And that feeds back into the computer system instantaneously, of course, there's a little computational delay, and will tell you the effect on uh, coefficient of drag, so aer aerodynamics, right? So as designers, you're not disconnected from the engineering part now because of this technology, being able to see what it looks like and see what your impact of changing the design is, like the looks from an aesthetics point of view on the engineering performance. And Toyota is also doing something similar with the augmented reality. Now theirs is a little different the example I'll give. So as cars go through the assembly line, and during the painting phase, uh, they have a quality assurance or a quality, quality control, I guess, uh, check procedure where they're checking paint thickness. But they have to do it at very specific locations consistently or you wouldn't get a good comparison from vehicle to vehicle. So historically, they would actually take a template and they would tape it onto the vehicle with certain index points, like whether it's mirrors or base windshield or whatever, and then it would mark where they would do the measurements. And that took time. So now instead they're wearing the hall lens and they simply come along and the dots are all shown on the vehicle and they just simply go take the measurements. So they cut the time from something like 20 minutes to two minutes per vehicle to do the check. So efficiency gains. Another example is offshore oil and gas. So this is uh, Equinor, formerly Stat Oil, one of their recent deployments off of um, uh, Norway in the North Sea. And uh, it's a natural gas facility, so there's a lot of piping. There's a lot of piping in the oil ones too, but a lot of piping. And their use case was from a QA perspective, you know, after piping's been installed, the engineer teams are out and they're doing their QA on, you know, all the piping and alignments and stuff. And then, you know, before they'd be standing there with drawings and, you know, it could take time to trace a pipe on the drawing, see where it looks. But with the hull lens, what it does is it overlays, correct spatially, where the, the pipeline that they want to check is. So you just follow it, right? I mean, you follow the holographic version of the pipe, make sure it overlays the pipe. You just follow from one end to the next. And they were doing uh, what was taken over an hour is now three minutes. So big efficiency gains. So next category is data visualization. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of as it says, and what I was talking about for IoT, just the ability to see data in situations where you wouldn't see it otherwise. And you may have to refer to a manual or a tablet or a screen or something like that. So instead, the information just comes up. Example I have here is uh, Volvo. So they're doing a lot of stuff with the hall lens. And uh, so in this case, the worker, uh, as stuff comes down the assembly line, and, you know, cars are customized, even if they're uh, pre ordered by dealerships, they come with different options. So from a production perspective, you, need, you know, this car may have a different speaker system in the doors than the next one sort of thing. And the system automatically tells the worker what has to go in it, but goes one step further. So when they turn around and look at the parts bin, the parts that have to be installed on this car are highlighted. So it becomes very seamless. There's less likely uh, chance of an error. Things go faster, hence gains in efficiency. This example I really like is uh, Bilstein, so they use uh, shocks, suspension for cars and various other things. Um, so their popularity has grown a lot in recent years, and their big issue was uh, having difficulty filling orders quickly and efficiently. And, and they, they started their presentation, they said, you know, we're, we're blaming Amazon for this. Everybody expects next day delivery now. And they said, we just weren't up to that. We weren't meeting it. We couldn't fill orders quick enough. The system was not streamlined enough. So now the way it works is literally if you go onto their website and place an order, that order would pop up immediately for somebody like Leon here. For this particular case, this site, Leon was their top person for filling orders quickly. And they did the pilot with him, with the hull lens, to see what the improvement was on Leon's performance. And what they found is 
he was filling orders 22% faster because the order just popped up on his screen, showed him what it was, and then when he started the process, it would show him the most efficient route to go through the warehouse to pick up all the stuff he needed because there, you know, maybe a part from this bin and several aisles over, there's another bin you got to pick a part from. So not only does it show you like actual arrows and lines on the floor where to go to be most efficient, but when it shows you, you know, where it is on the shelves and when you get there, he looks at it and the system scans it, takes it out of inventory, verifies it's the right part for this order, but takes it out of inventory. They don't have to do inventories anymore, right? It's all there. And as he's walking along, it might also say, you know, caution up ahead, forklift coming down that aisle. So all of a sudden, Leon is like super efficient. He's running around there filling orders like that, right? So, you know, now they're rolling it out to all the other staff to see kind of what improvements they can get on them. But the whole thing was that, you know, this was their most efficient guy and they made him much more efficient by introducing the technology. And they're able to get orders out next day, which is their, or hopefully delivered next day. That, that was their kind of end game. This is a company that we partner with occasionally for projects here in uh, Canada. They're based in the Toronto area. Uh, I like to, and it's a good, good construction fit. Everybody can, can relate to it. Buried Underground Services. They essentially created a way for you to have x-ray vision. That's the way I like to describe it. You can walk onto a site and you can see all the buried services. There they are. They're just holographically shown for you. Now they have a, um, an add-on to their system that requires a GPS transmitter. It's the only way it works because they are outdoors. And so it doesn't, remember I talked about the issues with spatial mapping, right? So that's their workaround. They have a, uh, a GPS device on a tripod you set up and then it indexes where you are spatially in terms of GPS and then allows you to go around. Now the systems are only as good as your as-built drawings, of course, because it doesn't really have x-ray vision. It doesn't really see the buried underground surfaces. It just displays what it knows to you. Uh, but the nice thing about it is they've added it to the point where if you are drawing construction and you're digging stuff up and you're seeing things that are uh, not correctly placed as per the as-built, uh, you can uh, make that correction on the drawing and it feeds back to the original system right there in the field. So that's a huge benefit. Simulation training is another good example of, of applications of augmented reality. And, you know, it's about <coughs> making it more... Um, uh, you know, much more uh, uh, rich learning experience for somebody as opposed to, you know, reading about it. You can experience it. Uh, the example I'll give here is in the medical sector. So they have this device, it's called a, what was it? It's called a, 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 a Vivdix mannequin, I guess if I pronounce that right. It allows uh, students to learn how to do ultrasounds. So, uh, you know, you've got this mannequin that has uh, real organ placements and densities and all that stuff for the ultrasound to pick up but by using augmented reality, you take it one step further. Now, the doctor or technician training on to use the ultrasound equipment, when they put the device on, they see the organs as well in the body, right, through augmented reality. So then when you're doing the x-ray, you know, or not the x-ray, the ultrasound, you know you're going over the kidney or whatever it is. So when you look at the x-ray screen, you can say, okay, so that, you know, and how about this angle? It, it, it totally elevated the experience. And the quote that they gave from the project uh, was, this generation of learners comes to the classroom with a different set of skills, eager to interact with technology. And that's, that's kind of key. Uh, the younger folks entering the workforce like this technology. They get excited by the technology. It can actually be a differentiator in attracting new talent, right? If you have two companies that are vying for the same individual and one is using augmented reality solutions and that person's gonna get to do really cool stuff with augmented reality versus the other company, all things being equal, where are they gonna go? Right, They're probably gonna to go to the company using the more advanced technologies. So now I'm gonna go into uh, the last use case, which is remote collaboration system. That, that's, that's our space, that's what we do as our company. And it's about uh, leveraging your expertise. I talked about knowledge transfer, and that's kind of a theme I wanna continue with that. Knowledge transfer, it's very important. Uh, so it's about accessing the experts anytime, anywhere, putting them in touch with the people that need that, that guidance and advice as soon as possible. So, you know, the collaboration, the ability to overlay holograms, documents, photographs, your surrounding environment, that's how you enrich the connection. It's not just a cell phone call. 
cell phone call you're talking, but then you're trying to articulate and explain to the person what is your scene, what is you're doing, where you are. Whereas they can see what you can see and your hands free heads up, you're safer, you're better connected, it's a much more meaningful exchange. So specific to our solution, the software is called Remote Spark. Um, so I want to talk about what it does to kind of delve into more details of the specific. So I've mentioned the hands-free, heads up, point of view video. Uh, our two hallmarks of our solution is that it's extremely low bandwidth and very high security. And the low bandwidth is very important because in particular construction, do you guys have Wi-Fi at sites? Probably not, at least not in the early stages, for sure, right? Well, you don't need it. Uh, the bandwidth we require to do the call is so low that it's very easy to achieve with a mobile hotspot on your phone. Like if you have a 3G connection with one bar, you're good to go. So you don't need anything special. You just do a hotspot on your phone, put the headset on, you're connected, you make the call back to the expert anywhere in the world, doesn't matter where they are, and, and you can talk to them. And if security is a priority, then, then that's, that's, we have that covered. Largest client, Canadian military, Last year, we received an award from NATO uh, for the level of security we offer. Uh, we've been recognized by Microsoft uh, with two separate awards uh, at the world level in terms of what we do. Uh, and we were just named by Deloitte for one of the uh, 50 fastest up and coming growing companies or whatever the title's called. Uh, so, you know, we got the security covered, we got the low bandwidth covered, and, uh, and it's being recognized as important by people. So you'll get the full demo at the end of my talk in terms of what we can do with this, but you can capture images. That's first and foremost what I'll talk about. And you'd say, well, why are you gonna capture an image? Like you're looking at it, you've got the point of view video, right? We find that capturing images can be very effective. So, you know, say you're looking at an electrical panel and you know, you're trying to describe the person, what are they, they gotta do? Well, that's not as efficient as if I take a snapshot of that, like an actual photograph, and then have that photograph float as a two-dimensional hologram for the person, they can position it right beside the, you know, the, the object, and then have the expert on their PC have that photograph and then start annotating. This is the wire you need to remove, you gotta plug it in over here. You know what I mean? You can start kind of uh, you know, qu quickly describing the details, the intricacies. And then that image is right there floating, right? So very handy that way. Share files, this is obvious, so like, I'll use the example of the electrical panel. You want to send a wiring schematic to the person. You're easy. Drag and drop. Drag and drop, it comes up. If it's PDF, multiple pages, you have multiple pages, you'll see that example when we go through it. So then they can flick through it. You're not going to send somebody a 2,000 page document. That doesn't make any sense. You know, you're going to send them the relevant pages is, is the way we view it. I've talked a bit about the sharing the 3D holograms, but I haven't mentioned animations. I think animations is like awesome. Um, if you show somebody, and we have examples of this, so if you show somebody an animation of a complex task, and the one we're gonna show is of a blast furnace. So we were working with Hatch, most of you guys would know who Hatch is, uh, if one of their clients in the steel industry and they wanted to showcase this technology to them. So they have a uh, blast furnace to melt the, the ore to make steel. And uh, uh, I didn't realize this, but there's a device called a TWIR. It's uh, part of the blast furnace where the air gets injected at high pressure in to create such a hot fire. And these tweers uh, need to be replaced periodically. Uh, but the way they explain it is that, well, it's often enough that, uh, but not often, like, you know, it's, it's, it's based on, we do it often, but not often enough that people tend to remember how to do it. And because there's a, a bit of a tricky part with how you disconnect the water line and stuff like that. So what they were finding is, you know, whatever 18 months, they'd have to replace the ones on their furnace. And, you know, and maybe it was a different technician that did it last time, and now there's another one doing it. You're like, well, I haven't did this in a long time, can't remember. So they asked us to create an animation for this. And they gave us all the step-by-step -step instructions of what, what they need to show, what to highlight. We created that. We took it down to an event in Pittsburgh, showcased it to them and a bunch of other uh, steel industry people. And without exception, everybody was like, oh my God, I could have anybody on the plant floor, plant floor do a, a tweer replacement now. All I have to do is show them this. So when you connect with the person and you've got the expert watching what they're doing, and if the expert then sends them this animated CAD file, hologram, of how to do it, and then they watch it, and then the expert still watches them carry it out, it's all smooth and efficient, and you don't, no delays, you don't, the expert didn't have to go there. Uh, and like they said, I can have anybody in the plant floor do it. So I already mentioned the ability to display live IoT data. Uh, our software does that so that you could simply you know, walk into a room 
and the uh, uh, if you have it preset, it'll they'll just come up, right? Like you bring up the holograms, and they they know that they're already connected to that feed. So all we do is is intercept that stream uh, of data that's going to the internet. For your purposes, what software limitations are still present within Google's user interface? We don't use any Google. Okay. No. Uh, this is Microsoft products. We're using Windows, okay. right? And Windows 10 is the reason. So, like, I'm jumping ahead here, but like, it's a HoloLens communicating with an expert on a regular PC. The expert does not need to have a HoloLens. And some people have said, oh, well, can we do it on our phone? Not yet. And the reason is uh, in order to guarantee the high level of security and take full advantage of the mixed reality capabilities for the holograms. We can't do that yet on an iOS or an Android device. It's just not there. Uh, so we have to use the Windows 10. It's the only way we can get the full benefit out of the whole thing, right? So there's no limitations around the Google for us. But there, uh, other people would use Android-based uh, software. So to, Microsoft's user interface, that, uh, like within the HoloLens, yeah. is there limitations still present there with the user interface? Not really. It's a real simple interface. Like um, We'll show you the gestures. I mean, there's only two gestures for this is the HoloLens 1. HoloLens 2 is just, it's, it's been announced for a while, but it's just released. Like We're starting to ship just now. Uh, so I don't have a HoloLens 2 with me. Um, but HoloLens 1 is pretty simple to use. The gestures, there, there's two main gestures. One's called the balloon and then air tap. And that's it. So in terms of user interface, you see your menus, you see your screens, whatever. No different than you have multiple screens open on your PC. There's just one here, one there, one there. You can walk around, you can move them, chuck them away, whatever, bring them back. Uh, so it's very, very efficient that way for user interface. I have about a thousand questions on this screen, but um, I, I taught character animations gaming environment, so I understand the steps yeah. with uh, rigging characters. Now, what is there any plans of virtual characters assisting in the HoloLens environment? Have you looked at that? No, it's not something we're looking at. And other people are doing a more like avatars right. as opposed to a virtual character right. where it's a uh, holographic rendering of you. Right. You're not here, but there's a holographic rendering of you here in front of me. Mm -hmm. We look at that and say, well, Okay, that's neat, but do you need to be here for our 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 app? Like what we're trying to achieve, we're trying to get your expertise here. We don't need you here right. because the bandwidth required to get you here and have as you move around and have that react the same is huge. That's what I was going to mention. What level of detail? That's critical in game environment. Yes. Yes. You know, it probably is in your environment. It is, but uh, what we tell people is, I mean, there, there's two ways to look at things. There's the, like if you look at a CAD file and then want to convert it to a hologram, you can make it really pretty, you know, with textures and, and, and scuffs on it and stuff like that. But uh, from an engineering perspective, do you need that? Probably not. So that removes a lot of the uh, computational burden off the system to not have to render that information. So if you take a simple CAD file, and typical CAD files aren't pretty, uh, they're functional. Uh, you know, they convey the information we need. Uh, you don't tend to pretty them up. Like, they don't tend to look the, the right color, and they don't, you know, but they show what you need. Uh, and, and so that's what we tend to encourage our clients to stick with. Like, let's not uh, complicate things unnecessarily. Because then the files just get really big, and they get, you know, because, I mean, this has its limitations. Like, you can't take, you know, a, a BIM model of an entire building and expect to drag and drop that into the HoloLens. It's just not going to happen. You know, you might not be able to open on a regular PC in certain formats. You know, you need like a workstation or something. Well, this is not a workstation. This is like a you know a laptop. So it's a, a different tool for the job sort of thing, right? We have what you call enterprise hologram galleries. So if you know that workers are going to need certain like access certain digital content regularly, you can pre-populate that for them, have it all ready so it's at their fingertips. So they don't need to. They may not need at all to connect to the expert. They may need to simply put on the HoloLens, start up our software, and basically access that data and just bring it up themselves. Like if they know they need a wiring schematic or a particular uh, animation of a hologram or something like that, they can just bring it up. Uh, so really simple that way. Now coming soon, we do have what we call object recognition uh, using artificial intelligence. So one of the feedbacks we've got from some of our industrial clients is that 
one of the number one issues they have in the field with their, their, their workforce is that they work on the wrong piece of equipment. <laughs> so you send them out to do maintenance on a compressor and they, can, they did, but it wasn't the right one. And if you've been to some of these industrial sites, you can understand because you know you go into the building and there is 32 compressors that all look the same. So you know if you're sent out to work on one of them, well, you thought you worked on you know the one that's you know C247894 compressor, and oh, I didn't work on that one. It was a different one. It looks same. Uh, but what we've said is so the ability to go out to a site and basically say remote spark, what is this, and it will know that is that compressor. Has to have some sort of characterizing uh, feature, it could be a serial number, it could be anything, that you visually look at that makes it unique. Because yes, they could all look the same, and you can't just go by that, uh, but if it has like a QR code or a serial number or anything like that, uh, that'll work. And then what it does is through integration with the ERP systems, so enterprise resource planning systems, so like a, an IBM uh, a Maximo or a Microsoft Dynamics or anything like that, it will reach out to that and say, is there any content there associated with this piece of equipment that I just recognized and bring it to you? So if you're there to work on it, one of the first things it'll probably pull is the work order. So here comes the work order. You're like, oh yes, I want the work order. And then you say, well, I want to see the previous uh, maintenance records, you know, or the service manual or whatever it is. It's all right there, right? It's all just connected through the ERP. So that was direct feedback from clients, so something they wanted added and stuff, so working towards that. Do you link with software like SAP and all those like maintenance software, client software? If they're going through the ERP system, yes. Okay. It depends on how they're configured. Because uh, the first time that we did, um, uh, uh, for instance, like the first time we did the integration with IoT, we were with a company called T4G that's also based here in New Brunswick that specialize in that very thing for, for industry. And uh, you know there was we had some discussions. and They're like, oh, we'll send a couple people up, and we'll see you know what's involved in getting this hooked up so that we can display this live I IoT data for you. Because we're just the visualization component, so that they would like we don't. That's not what we want to get into. We want to work with companies that specialize in that and just add this visualization component to them. So they figured this may take half the day or something, right? Uh, about 20 minutes, it was all done. They're like, oh, that was easy. So in a similar vein, when we start talking about ERP systems, uh, as we do more implementations with clients, we'll get a better sense on just how cumbersome and complicated they are to get set up. Uh, it, it depends is the big thing. How they have their system set up, what they're ready to integrate with, and you know, because we just need the integration. So if they're struggling, we'll be struggling. But if they're all on top of it, we'll be smooth sailing sort of thing. So from our perspective, uh, you know, the benefits, and why does this matter? Like why should somebody look at the remote assistance, remote worker support type solution? You know, in the, in the end, time and money. That's what it boils down to, it's time and money. But there's other non, you know, other things that are as important but not as easy to kind of put your finger on, right? I've talked about better leveraging your experts, talked about the knowledge transfer, and that's so important. Can't emphasize it enough, because that's, you know, the number one thing that we hear from people, this is, this is the problem is helping them solve, right? Like, we didn't create a solution looking for a problem. We identified a problem and developed a solution for it. You know, and it's about connecting the right people to the right you know, locations at the, at the right time as quick as possible. But there's also these issues about travel and health and safety. So we're hearing more and more, especially from the oil and gas clients, that they look at this, they're like, yeah, yeah, we save money, but just think of the, the benefits from a health and safety point of view. Like, oh, okay. So, you know, tell us more. And you know, what they're saying is that, like, for instance, if you have an offshore installation, I'll, I'll pick on them because we're on the East Coast, so you've got like Newfoundland, you've got four operating offshore facilities there for oil and gas. If you want to send somebody out to the Hibernia platform, and, you know, the expert's down in Houston, so you're thinking, okay, you know, we've called, we can't resolve it the old school way, we can't resolve it, we're going to bring them up to site. Well, they got to fly from Houston. That's the least of your concerns. They need what's called BSC training before they can go off site. You just can't go off site unless you have it. Well, this training doesn't happen daily, it has to be scheduled. So you have to find out when the next training course is. Oh, well, it's in two weeks. Okay, so the person's gotta go do that. Two full days. It, it ends with you having to jump out of a helicopter in the ocean in a survival suit. It's, it's kind of exciting. But it's a big deal, right? 
And then ultimately you get this person out on site. So they got to be flown out by helicopter. Well, that's, you know, that there's a danger associated with that, flying your employees around helicopters. And you get them out to site, they've never been on an offshore platform, right? Are they, are they a safety liability? Absolutely, right? So you got other people out there who work there every day and they're like, you know, holding their hand, making sure they don't get in trouble and stuff. So it's a big deal to get that expert to site. So from a health and safety point of view, if you can connect them remotely and not have them travel, well, you reduce, so there is a carbon footprint reduction and some of the companies are really latching on that as well. Like I know Chevron is, is uh, singing that from the rooftop, you know, in terms of their reduction in their carbon footprint by not having experts travel as much. And, and then the health and safety point of view is, is a big aspect as well, right? So, you know, what we thought was simply a knowledge transfer and, you know, saving you time and money, uh, client feedback is saying there's more to it than that even. There's more benefits. So that knowledge transfer, I mean, the skills gap, I've mentioned it several times, I won't dwell on it more, but that's very important. Uh, the reduction in equipment downtime, uh, the good one was the example from Porsche or uh, the one from uh, um, Thyssen Group. Or uh, we have like manufacturing clients will tell us on average, it's $122,000 an hour for if something's down. So if something's down and, and you know, they can't resolve it by conventional methods and they have to bring somebody to site, how many hours do you wait for that, right? You start to add in that big time. So if you can connect them quickly and reduce the, uh, the impact, that's, that's a huge savings. Reduction of errors, I think that's obvious from what I've said, like in terms of being able to quickly, you know, instead of looking at two dimensional drawings and trying to interpret what you're seeing, to be able to see it in three dimensions and be able to immediately understand what it is. But then also keep in mind, if, if you're doing the remote worker support with an expert connected, the expert is watching over your shoulder the whole time. So you should have a reduction in errors, absolutely. They're gonna make sure you don't do anything wrong because they're watching it, right? They've described how, how to do the task and now they're gonna watch you do the task and then they can sign off on it from you know, a quality perspective at the end to say, yeah, I saw it be done, it's all correct. Have you guys made any process uh, gains on the insurance industry on the fact that you should be getting reduced premiums on the fact that all these companies are switching this? Should be That's a good point, I like that. I you know we haven't thought about that yet. We'll, we'll, we'll bring that up. That might be an issue, yeah. Uh, now I will say like, um, most of the hardware coming out is designed for industry, the stuff that's targeting industry. Uh, but the hull lens itself is uh, a safety glass rated on the front. So it has CSA, ANC, and EN standards for certification. It's drop, a drop rating, it has dust rating, uh, it has attachments for a hard hat. Uh, it also is controlled by voice commands and hand gestures. And it's very, the hand gestures are very broad. Like I said, there's what they call the bloom and the air tap. So if you're wearing gloves, not a problem. You can air tap with gloves, that all works. So from a personal protective equipment point of view, it, it's all fine that way. And it's very comfortable, like uh, we didn't bring the hard hat, hard hat attachment today, but it's very comfortable in particular on the hard hat because instead of having to wear it, you know, kind of directly on your head, it attaches the hard hat so the weight's carried by the harness. So it's, it's, I, could, I could leave it on my head all day in the hard hat. So at that point, what's the long-term health benefit, uh, hazard with regards to, with regards to migraines and there's, effects? Yeah, there's been a number of studies. Um, uh, there's an organization called AREA, which is the Augmented Reality Enterprise Association, I think is what it's called. We're a member of it. And uh, that's a big part of what they focus on. And they're doing work with uh, universities in the UK that are doing the health benefits, ergonomics, all that kind of stuff, like eye strain, like they're doing all those studies. And what they're finding is with the monoc monocle devices, so you know, you're wearing a pair of glasses that has the little arm that comes around, right? Um, and, and I've had those headsets on now a couple times and I find it tricky with those devices. I find the eye strains a lot because, you know, you've got this thing that's in front of your eye and you're supposed to kind of see everything around it, which you can, but you, clearly see this and then when you want to look at it you kind of have to like refocus up close like it appears to be further but you have to kind of focus on it and see it so I find this kind of this switch back and forth whereas uh, when you're wearing the full immersive glasses uh, I see everybody fine and I just see a hologram here so if I look away I don't I don't see anything and I come back here and I see the hologram so I find it very uh, and, and the studies are showing that there's less eye strain, there's less fatigue associated with a full immersive device like that, right? And uh, two of the other uh, full immersive devices on the market, um, I have issues with, because uh, the couple times I've had them on and, and used them, 
Uh, they're very closed on the sides. Uh, I won't name them because there's no reason to pick on them, but, but the, they're, they're like goggles. So, you know, they're like right on your head, you still see out. But as a result, there's absolutely zero peripheral vision. So I'm thinking, geez, if I was at an industrial site or walking around, this is not ideal. Like I can't really see if there's anything moving all here, right? So, so I wouldn't like that at all. Uh, now, uh, so in terms of eye strain, so they've showed that this has very little compared to the monocle device. And they've did some studies for like longer term, like, you know, what happens if somebody wears it like all day? And they've showed that really it's, it's not an issue, like from all the studies so far. Uh, now, having said that, our typical usage for our solution tends to be in the 20, 25 minute duration, right? You're somewhere, you've encountered a problem, you're gonna make a call. It's kind of no different than making that cell phone call. Like how long was that gonna last? That wasn't gonna be an eight hour call. You know what I mean? Like it shouldn't be an eight hour call. You know, so if you're gonna call somebody, it's probably a quick call, okay, 10, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, something in that range, right? That's what we find. So as a result, we don't feel there's any issue with eye strain or anything like that. So uh, the use case that I'm gonna talk about first for uh, the remote worker support. So one of our clients is, it's an oil and gas company based in Calgary and they have operations in various locations, but where they first deployed was in North Dakota. And fun fact about North Dakota, uh, so when I was looking at going there, uh, Devin, Devin's, Devin and Ryan are gonna be helping me with the demos. When Devin and I were gonna to go to North Dakota, I went to check on flights. Uh, Air Canada does not fly to anywhere in North Dakota. Uh, so it's kind of a remote area just as a state, I guess. And then you look at you know, carriers like uh, United and Delta, and yeah, they fly to North Dakota, but then it was gonna be a 12 hour car drive to this site. So they didn't get partic particularly close. So the point of that is that, so their, their issue was head office in Calgary, they have a lot of qualified staff down in the Houston area, and they have these operations in North Dakota. It's an oil production site, and they do have some um, uh, hydrogen sulfide production issues, so they have uh, scrubbers and the dehydration units, so they have, they have some issues with production quite often at that site. And uh, what happens is stuff goes down, and they have to mobilize an expert at site, this is the old way, and their expectation was three days. Three days before they get somebody on site. And that's when it's urgent. And they were, I think there's, they were saying around $150,000, $200,000 a day for loss production. So maybe you're only at reduced capabilities, like reduced production, like a 50% or something, so less, less loss. But the point is, it costs them a whack of money to wait for the experts to get to site. And it's not easy to get there. And they came to us and said, we like your solution, but we're really concerned about our internet connectivity. Like, we're in the middle of nowhere, sometimes we can't even make a cell phone call, like we don't know how this is gonna work. And they have cell phone boosters and all that kind of stuff, right? So we said, look, try it. So they went and the response back was, oh my God, it worked. It works, it works on site. Like we can barely make a phone call, but yet we can do remote spark calls on the hall lens. And that's because it's so low bandwidth, right? It's one of our key differentiators in our solution. So as a result now, in most cases, they don't need to have the expert travel site. They make the remote spark call, they talk to whoever it needs to be, whether somebody in Calgary or Denver or Houston, and they're able to resolve the issue with nobody going to site. Saves them a whack of money. Second use case that I just stuck in here is, uh, and I like this one because of Eric the Viking. So meet Nick and Eric. Eric is known as Eric the Viking. I didn't get the whole story on why that is. I, I don't know, we, we weren't told why it was Eric the Viking. But uh, so uh, Nick is uh, one of our, uh, what I like to call our operational champions. Uh, he loves this technology and he's shown it off to everybody. And uh, we were out there doing the initial training with him. And he's like, we wanna go out to the e-house. So they're standing in E-House. So if you're not familiar with E-House is, it's, it's a small building, roughly the size of this room, give or take. <clears throat> and they put a lot of sophisticated equipment in it. And they do this at their site, they get their facility, and then it gets transported to an oil and gas client's site. And then everything just gets plugged into it. So electrical, communications, electronics, instrumentation, all that's built in, ready to go. So it just arrives on site, everything plugs in, it works. Eric, Eric the Viking's responsibility is to build this E-House. Nick's the design guy. So he's out here and he's in the e-house because he's got the hologram of the entire e-house up so that he's standing in the middle of it and he can look around and see all the equipment on the wall, the cable trays, where the lights go, everything, right? It's all just there. And he's like, this is really cool. Eric walks through and we, we couldn't have scripted this better, right? Eric just comes through by chance and Nick's like, Eric, try this on. So Eric puts it on. He's like, oh, really awesome. He's like, 
Oh my God, that's how those lights go. I thought they were going to be above the cable trays. Like he said, for three days I've been looking at those drawings trying to figure out where the goddamn lights go. It's a simple thing, right? Nick's like, oh my God, that probably saved us a whole bunch of rework because you'd put them in the wrong place. So Eric walked through, within 30 seconds, identified the cost savings to pay for the whole investment, right? So, so they're very happily using it, a lot of uh, uh, oil and gas sites right now. So we do have uh, a deployment in, uh, it's a limited deployment, but it's, it's in a construction uh, uh, space in the GTA area in Toronto. And uh, so it's building construction. And it's primarily about resolving, uh, you know, the, the conventional issues, you know, HVAC, electrical, uh, plumbing, like those types of conflicts. So they don't have to bring the different people to site when something comes up, they can connect everybody remotely and, and get through it. And they're also, they identified a, a use case uh, around the architect. And I, I, I've encountered this before in my past life as a professional engineer, where, uh, you know, you're on site, something's come up and they're like, oh, we gotta wait for the architect to come and, you know, the tell us if this is going to be okay, whatever, and, and you have to wait. So you put that on hold. And, and then, you know, and it, the architect shows up in two weeks and then you can resume work on it sort of thing. So instead, on this particular job, uh, and, and, and this is where I guess I'm going on it, where it seems to happen more often than not, the job was in the Toronto area, the architect was in Denmark. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's architects in Toronto, in Canada, like, but we, all, we never seem to use an architect in the same area as the building. I don't know why that is. At least that's my experience on too many occasions. But this way, instead of the architect coming, because he was scheduled to come every three weeks to site, because uh, he has to fly from Denmark. Uh, and so instead of waiting for that you know, three week interval, they could just call the architect and, and in most cases resolve the issue without having to wait. So a lot, a lot big benefit there. This is one of our clients uh, right here in New Brunswick. They're in, in the Bathurst area. Um, and I like the, the way they describe themselves is they, they look after everything that rotates in your facility. So pumps, compressors, uh, generators, anything that has turning parts sort of thing. And they have a lot of operations up in Lab City area for uh, mining related processing. And they always have people on site. But what they have is, um, uh, what will come up quite often is uh, issues around um, uh, not having the right person on site. So they've got somebody there that you know maybe is really good as a machinist or a mechanical, but they need electrical. So they end up having to historically fly people from Bathurst on chartered flights to Lab City in the middle of the night or on the weekend because they got to get the issue resolved because they were unable to do it over the phone. So now they are doing it remotely with the mixed reality solution. I'll just quickly go with the last couple slides. So uh, we gained a lot of experience, like I mentioned, in deployments. Uh, in terms of how to deploy this technology, how to be successful quickly and, and get clients up and going. And I did a keynote presentation down in Houston earlier in the year and then subsequently turned that into an ebook that can be downloaded on our website and takes you through kind of the, the 13 steps for a successful pilot in terms of what you should do, how to approach it. So, you know, identifying the pain points, what the problems are, uh, you know, um, getting the scope and, and a very target usable um, um, use case scenario. Defining that baseline for you know the uh, KPIs, uh, and then picking your solution in terms of what you're going to do. Having the project champions, you should always have one at the corporate level, one operational. Corporate will help drive things. Like if IT is starting to cause a little issue, like in terms of oh we don't want to put that on our device or on our network, uh, have somebody kind of push that through, and and uh, the whole process of how you train people, and then in that whole test group. So you start out with a small pilot basically. And in terms of where you're storing the hardware so people can get at it quickly, you know, if you've got to be at a job site, you better be in the truck sort of thing, right? They better have it with you. Uh, we stay very close with our clients during this whole phase in terms of the ongoing support and determining the ROI and, and then the whole lessons learned for them to make sure that they can move on from there. And for AR uh, maturity model, I'll just quickly go through these because I want to have time to do our uh, uh, demo. Uh, so what I want to show is that, um, uh, you know, little guidance, this is new. So unless you have somebody to kind of help you through the process, you don't want to be on your own sort of thing. And we can help clients maximize that ROI quickly because we've learned lessons through other deployments. So it's not our first one sort of thing. And basically there are four stages to the AR maturity. Uh, the first one being, you know, you're exploring the idea. You're, you're looking at it, trying to figure out what you want to do. You know, your goal is to be more productive. You want to have a higher safety. You want to collaborate more effectively. Uh, but you're, you're just getting started. 
Stage two, you're actually deploying. You have a use case you're supporting. You know, you're moving through that, whether it be you know the see what I see video calling, uh, sharing work instructions, stuff of that nature. Uh, and then the third stage being, you know, you're actually seeing the real value. So you're starting to see big savings, starting big efficiency gains, right? You're starting to look at a more broader deployment in your organization. You know, it's going to be a focus. And the fourth one really is where you're leading. Like you are now, like when I mentioned Thyssen Group, you know, for elevators and chairlifts, you know, with over 850 hull engines units deployed, they're leading, you know. Equinor is another big company, you know, in the world that's leading, Boeing. You know, like these folks have already, they, they've been into this now for several years and they've ironed out all the little issues and they're becoming very good with it and, and their business use case is solid. Like they're saving a lot of money, it's making them much more competitive compared to their uh, competition. So that's the summary. So we went over kind of what it was in general, uh, you know, where it fits in industry, the wearables, uh, general use cases, spend a little bit of time on the remote worker support, and uh, successful pilot projects and the overall maturity. So I'm going to uh, get Devin and Ryan to help here now. We'll do a call. We'll do a, a, we may not have a lot of time for everybody to get it on their heads, but we'll do a quick call so you can kind of see how it works, how to put it on, and, uh, and then we can try to uh, see how many people can try it on. All right. So the software, as you'll see here that I'm opening, is extremely simple. You won't see any fancy pull down menus, like right, it's, if you see a lot there, there's a couple buttons on the left, like it's all pretty straightforward. So this, what you're seeing is the expert perspective here right now, right? This is the expert on here. Devin could be anywhere in the world, somewhere else, but we're gonna connect right here live. I better make sure my speakers are off. Yeah, because we'll get feedback because we're in the same room. So all I got to do is click go online. And I guess what we skipped over is the putting on of the hull lens. Uh, so yeah, just quickly. So there's an adjustment in the back for tightening the whole thing. So when you put it on your head, you tighten the whole thing and then the whole, the whole assembly kind of slides back and forth. So you kind of move it in so it's comfortably sitting you know, close to your, on the bridge of your nose. Now Devin initi initiates the call. So I'll go ahead and get Devin to initiate the call. So he's seeing basically the same interface that we're seeing at this point. So he comes up and all I do is answer the call. And then it takes roughly, what is it, 30 seconds or so to do all the uh, handshakes and encryptions. Cause this is, even though we're in the same room, this is all going up to the cloud. It goes through uh, Azure for uh, the data storage and, and, and computation. So some of this stuff happens up in the cloud as well. So, you know, his communicating up through the cloud comes back down here. So now we have the video. So there's the point of view video. So now as the expert, I see everything that Devin sees. And if we had the sound turned on, we'd be talking, he'd hear me, he hears me anyway, he's in the same room. And uh, so what I'll do for starters is I will send Devin a simple PDF file. So I can simply just open a file and drag and drop it over. And then it'll come up for Devin. You don't need to know by a little warning on the microphone. So there's the PDF. So Devin sees the little symbol. He can place it where he wants. And then he can easily move it around. He can manipulate it. He can make it smaller. He can go from page to page. It stays put. So if he walks around. You'll see he walks behind it. At any given time, he can make it turn to face him. So it's very easy to manipulate it. And the quality that he sees is far superior to the quality you're seeing here on the screen because it's kind of coming through like you're seeing it almost like third hand here. He sees it firsthand, so it's like crisp, clean, he can read it, no problems at all. I'm the expert, I sent it to him, so I don't really need to read it, I probably prepared it and I know what's on it anyway. But I could have it open on my separate screen with a separate window. Can I just, uh, and PDFs, a lot of PDFs now, you can integrate 3D in it so you can interact in the PDF. Can you do that in your system? I don't believe we can do that. No, we can't no. do that, no. Okay. No, because the PDFs are actually converted, effectively, we, we convert them to a JPEG behind the scenes. Right. Right. So they're a photograph, okay. basically. Gotcha. Okay. So speaking of photographs, I will take a photograph next. So what do you want? You look at something, I'll take a photograph of. All right. So take photo, I just click that. So you can see it's already popped up on my screen. 
So right off the bat, if I wanted him to do something, I can annotate this and say, you know, that's what you got to change. This has got to come off. You know, I can start conveying that and then I can switch back to the video. Now you can see that he sees the picture with the annotations on it, right? So it's very, very easy to do that. So the next thing I'll send over is an animated hologram and I'm going to send the Twir since I mentioned it. So this is that part from the blast furnace uh, where they have to replace it periodically but not often enough they tend to remember. Comes in as a package, he places it where he wants opens it up, and just like before, he can manipulate it, he can turn it around, he can make it bigger, smaller, wherever he wants to place it. So if you were standing beside the real Twir, you'd position it strategically right beside it. So you're looking at the real one, you're looking at the, the animated hologram. Look, you're still getting textures on those models. Though. Well, you can put as much through as you want. Like, you can make it, so Ryan over there is our 3D modeler, and, right. and he's like, yeah, I can make it look <laughs> as good as you want. But then the file gets bigger and, yeah, and yeah. It, it's unnecessary in some cases. Yes. So when we do show people, we tend to pretty them up a little more mm -hmm. just for show. Yeah. But in practice, you don't really need to do much to them. You can pretty well take a CAD file, and if it's been animated in a CAD program, mm -hmm. and then convert it to what well, the file format we need is a GLTF, uh, and which is a very um, common file format. It's like JPEGs are photographs. GLTF is the holograms. And then you can just convert it over. So uh, Devin, if you can run the animation. So in this case, you'll see some of the bolts start to pull out, drop away. The main piece will come out. And if you were looking really closely, you could see the highlighting where the water lines are disconnected. So the bad piece is out, or the red piece is the bad piece that has come out, the actual twir, and the green will be the replacement. And of course, whatever you want to show, right? I mean, you just animate it however you want it to be. And there's lots of programs out now that allow you to animate in CAD. So that's not a hardship. It's easy to do. And uh, we find, so when we start, we tend to get clients to send us the drawings to make sure everything's OK. In some cases, Ryan may have to spend hours fixing it up because they, you know, maybe it was just simply too big. Like we got one sent to us the other day that had six and a half million polygons. Well, that's too big. Sorry, but the HoloLens can't even handle that. You're not bringing in 3D LiDAR or anything either. Right? No, no, but you could. You could downsample that into something usable. Yeah. Because as you know, like no different than an Excel plot of a graph where maybe you've got, you know, a million data points, but it's basically a squiggly line that does this. Right. Well, you can drop probably every, only show one out of every 10,000 data points and right. the line looks identical. So you do the same thing for LiDAR data. Yeah. If you just downsample it to what you need, you can share it easily. So. So I think we are getting close to the time. Uh, so if anybody wants to try it on, we can do that right now. And if I'm not mistaken, there's a break right now. Yes. We'll stay here and operational during the break. I don't know if that's frowned upon because they probably want you to go out and mingle, but um, if anybody wants to try it on, feel free.